Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, thanks a lot for being sort of the last survivors and coming to this last uh, session of the conference. Um, this is going to be about uh, stream processing uh, with Apache Flink. Uh, I am Kostas Tsumas. Uh, I'm PMC member uh, of Flink, uh, and in my day job, I have co-founded uh, Data Artisans, uh, which is a company based in Berlin who is the primary contributor uh, to Flink. Um, before I start, um, which of you was at the general Flink talk that was yesterday here in the summit? Okay, very few. So I'll try to make a very quick intro, but in this talk I will focus on the particular aspect of stream processing. Uh, before I get into the specifics, uh, I would like to motivate this a bit. Uh, so stream processing is becoming extremely popular, um, and uh, there's a very good reason for that. Uh, so in my personal opinion, stream processing is the next uh, logical step uh, in the data infrastructure. So if you were here in the previous talk uh, by LinkedIn, uh, you would see how LinkedIn pioneered, actually, uh, this data infrastructure uh, that puts streaming in a very central place. And the reason for that is uh, data availability. So if you look way, way back uh, when people introduced these things called data warehouses, what they really did was say, okay, let's take the data from all the transactional databases and put them in a central place uh, where we can do analytics on them. Uh, and that increased data availability, essentially. Data availability, uh, we can measure it in sort of three dimensions. Uh, so which data is available, when is it available, and who has access to this data? Uh, the problem with data warehouses was that data had to obey a very strict schema, uh, and very few people had access to this data. Uh, Hadoop changed this completely. Uh, it relaxed the schema assumption a lot. Uh, and it gave programmable access uh, to the data. So there are many companies out there where uh, sort of every developer has access to the Hadoop cluster. Uh, the, the bad thing, let's say, that Hadoop inherited uh, from its uh, predecessor technologies is that still data is av is av is becomes available very slowly. So data becomes available at the load rate of the Hadoop cluster. Now, the next logical step uh, that is happening is to sort of eliminate uh, the last the, this last barrier and make data available uh, at ingestion rate. Uh, and this is really uh, what streaming is about. Um, so what does streaming enable? So for many people, streaming is like what we're doing now, just a little bit faster. Um, actually, it's a lot more than that. Uh, the first thing that streaming enables uh, is uh, that it solves uh, a very nice data integration problem. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Uh, if you're following the work uh, that started at LinkedIn with Kafka, Samza, uh, and in particular, uh, this blog post that is mentioned here, uh, you can see uh, how this is extremely important. Uh, the second thing is, of course, yes, faster, so low latency applications. Everybody wants uh, to benefit from uh, analyzing the fresh data and not yesterday's data or last week's data. Uh, this is increasingly important in new applications uh, like uh, sensor applications, intelligent manufacturing, and so on. And the third point um, that uh, has not been uh, stressed uh, too much is that batch processing is actually a proper subset of stream processing. So streams is not uh, a special uh, add-on feature that only a few selected people uh, should have access to, but uh, in the end can actually cover the batch use case as well. So a good stream processor uh, can do uh, batch processing uh, very, very well, and this is exactly uh, the motivation uh, behind Flink. Uh, now, the other thing that we are seeing is that uh, this, this rise of streaming is, is also giving rise to a new stack, uh, which many people are deploying inside Hadoop. Uh, some people are deploying also outside Hadoop. Uh, where from where we had file systems, we are going to systems uh, that serve uh, event streams, uh, something like Kafka. Uh, and where we had batch processors, uh, we have stream processors uh, and apps on top of them. So it's very hard uh, to teach a traditional file system uh, without changing it, how to serve event streams properly, and it is equally hard uh, to take uh, a batch processor uh, and teach it uh, how to do uh, stream processing. Um, so 
how are people using this uh, in context, right? So uh, what a lot of people are doing uh, is putting in place an architecture where uh, data is coming from various uh, sources, say uh, server logs, transaction logs, sensors, and so on. So this data is continuously flowing uh, and ingested into a, a bus, something like Kafka. Uh, the, the role of Kafka there is basically to gather and backup streams, uh, offer them to consum for consumption to upstream services, and provide recovery uh, of the streams in case of a failure. The next thing that you need in uh, this kind of architecture is uh, a data streaming system, so a stream processor. Uh, and I have put that link here because this is uh, what I'm talking about, but you can also put uh, your favorite stream processor, SAMSA, uh, and so on. Uh, so the stream processor basically analyzes streams, transforms the streams, uh, correlates streams together, uh, and creates two things. First, it creates uh, derived streams that can be served to upstream systems, uh, say search engine, uh, a database, uh, even a dashboard, uh, or it can even put these derived streams back uh, to Kafka. Um, and the second thing that the stream processor creates uh, is continuously updatable states, so counters, things like that, that uh, all the streaming jobs create, that are again, that's again uh, served uh, to upstream systems. Uh, one particular example that uh, I have been uh, working on uh, is at a friend's uh, telecom uh, called Buick Telecom, where uh, they are putting exactly this architecture to work. Uh, they are ingesting streams uh, from various machine logs uh, into Kafka uh, in, a, in a raw format, and then they are using Flink to transform and schematize uh, this data and reach them and create something that they can work with. Uh, and, the, and these derived streams are either put back uh, to Kafka that serves upstream systems or are used directly uh, for alarming functionality where they notify their networking engineers uh, that something uh, has gone bad. Now, uh, one last thing before I tell you how you can do stream processing with Flink is what is Flink? So for the people that were not in the talk yesterday, uh, Flink, uh, it's an open source framework. Uh, it's an Apache project, it's a top level Apache project. Uh, it entered the Apache incubator uh, last April, April 2014, uh, graduated uh, December 2014. At its core, uh, Fling is a streaming data flow runtime, uh, so think uh, of a model uh, of DAGs with operators and edges between them. Uh, think of yeah, something like uh, Dryad or so. Uh, and, and that has the capabilities, uh, the capability to do uh, basically stream process. On top of the runtime, uh, Fling actually exposes two APIs. Uh, one is called the Dataset API, and the other is called uh, the Data Stream API. Both of them are embedded uh, in Java and Scala. Uh, the Dataset API uh, is uh, an API for batch processing, and the Data Stream API is an API for uh, stream processing. Both of them sit on top of exactly the same runtime because at the end of the, of the day, a batch program is really a stream program where the sources have a beginning and an end. Uh, on top of these APIs, the, the Flink project itself includes uh, a bunch of uh, libraries, so higher level libraries, higher level APIs, uh, or uh, compatibility layers. Uh, so here I have, let's see if I can show. Uh, so you can read them from, from left to right. Uh, so there's a Hadoop reduced compatibility layer. There's a table API, which is uh, something that gives you access to a table with logical attributes. This is basically the path of the Flink project uh, to provide SQL. Uh, Jelly is a graph uh, API and library where you can get a data type called a graph and do various transformations or vertex rendering iterations on it. Uh, and there is uh, a machine learning library, that, uh, an effort that started uh, very recently that gives you an API inspired by scikit-learn and a variety of already existing algorithms uh, to use. Uh, there's also third-party tools uh, that build uh, on top of, of, the, of the system. So these are not part of, uh, of Fling itself, uh, but translate to Fling prog uh, programs. One of them is Google Cloud uh, Dataflow, which is a system by Google uh, to do data processing that can run either uh, on-premise or in the Google infrastructure. Here, you, you would be able to run it on-premise, for example. Uh, Apache MRQL. Uh, there is work in progress uh, to do cascading on top of the data set API of Link uh, and Apache Zeppelin, which is a very nice uh, notebook uh, sort of system. Uh, and the same thing is true for the data stream API. Uh, so the, the table API, what I mentioned, uh, essentially our path to, 
to SQL is also available uh, on data streams. Uh, there is uh, some work uh, that needs to be done there in terms of defining windows. I will talk about this uh, more in detail later. Uh, Apache Samoa uh, is a library uh, for streaming incremental machine learning, Google Cloud Dataflow, uh, and uh, a compatibility layer uh, for Storm. So these are all efforts that are currently ongoing. Um, in addition to uh, extensibility at the top, uh, Fling also offers extensibility at the bottom to some extent. Uh, so the normal way, uh, the usual way to run Fling programs uh, is either by uh, doing by a cluster mode, which is basically a bare metal Fling cluster, uh, in Yarn, uh, so, so Fling in Yarn can run as a Yarn application, or in local mode, uh, which is essentially a very nice way to run it inside your ID, for example, and, and debug your application. And in addition to that, uh, the community has developed two backends. Uh, one is called the embedded mode that basically creates, uh, bypasses uh, the whole Fling runtime, threads, everything, and creates a single-threaded uh, program for you to use somewhere that you want to run the same code, either in the cluster or in a web container. Uh, and the backend for Apache Tez, uh, if you are very interested uh, in, let's say, uh, very native uh, yarn um, elasticity. All right. Uh, and why why would why would we create Fling, right? So what is what is the reason for uh, for one more engine? Uh, so really, the motivation behind Fling is the following. So uh, people are trying to do a lot, and people are trying to do a lot on top of of engines like Hadoop and so on. So people have tried to do stream processing, bus processing, machine learning at scale, graph analytics, and so on. And so we looked at these use cases and we said, okay, how can we create uh, a system that uh, can natively support all these access paths? So Fling, uh, and, and what we came up uh, with is Fling, which is a system that has actually first-class support for stream processing, so it does not build that on top of the engine. First-class support for bus processing, uh, by running batch programs on a streaming engine, uh, for support for machine learning by embedding iterations as a concept inside the data flow. So the, the, the runtime of Fling actually uh, has support for restricted uh, mode of cycles. Uh, and graph analytics by allowing a restricted mode of uh, mutable state, uh, but not exposing that to the user. Anyway, if you want to find uh, more about that, uh, there's a lot of material online. The focus of this talk now is how do we do stream processing? So I told you that uh, you know we're going. So there's this thing called batch processors, and there's th this thing, this new thing called stream processors. So what is a stream processor, anyways? Uh, so we published uh, a blog post recently. You can uh, read it at the link at the bottom. It also appears at the blog of uh, of Confluent, uh, where we basically share our experiences with building Fling and identify eight features that we believe are essential uh, to classify something as a stream processor. Uh, so pipelining, uh, stream replay, state, how to backup and restore the state, uh, how to offer high-level APIs to people, uh, and also be able to ingest bad, bad sources in addition to streaming sources. And finally, if you want to put this thing in very large deployments, high availability and dynamic scaling and scale out. I will talk about the first six of them because we don't have the last two but this is work in progress. I will also talk to you about uh, the roadmap of the project uh, in the end. Um, starting with pipelining. So pipelining is a very uh, basic concept that says when you have a distributed data flow program uh, that uh, sort of looks like that. So here we have uh, three instances, let's say three machines, uh, with a source task, a task that is tokenizing records, uh, and a task that is uh, windowing uh, and counting. Uh, and we have a shuffle between the tokenizer and the window count. Uh, the, the meaning of pipelining is that all of these tasks, even, they, even if they are different machines, they are live simultaneously and they push data to each other. So a task uh, will not have to wait for its predecessor to finish in order to start. Yeah? Uh, so pipelining, very basic concept. There are many pipeline engines out there. Fling is one of them. Uh, database engines or uh, things like Cloudera Impala uh, are, are also pipelined. Um, something that is, is often uh, confusing is that, so pipelining does not mean tuple at a time processing. Most pipeline systems, including Fling, actually do some buffering and buffer records uh, before sending them out at the network. So these two are actually completely orthogonal. 
Um, the next thing that I talked about is operator state. Uh, so if you want to do something a little bit more complicated on streams than uh, filters or record by record transformations, say you want to update a counter every time a new record comes in, then you need the notion of state. State is something that lives inside the operator and it is mutable, so it can change uh, with, with every incoming record. So Fling offers three uh, kinds of state. The first is user-defined state. Uh, when, you're when you're writing a Flink program, you're writing in Java or Scala, you can, you, you can define your own objects inside the operators, manipulate them as you wish, and the system offers you hooks to include these objects in the system checkpoints. The second one is Windows. Uh, so these are, this is state that is managed uh, fully by the system. So in Flink, there is time-based Windows, count-based, and data-driven Windows. And the third one uh, is managed state. Think of uh, distributed key value store that operators can get and put um, data. Now, at the very heart of the problem of building a, sim a streaming system is uh, how do you do fault tolerance? Yeah, and this is uh, a major difference between batch processors and stream processors. Now, in fault tolerance, there are two major notions, uh, and there are two major things uh, that you would like uh, to guarantee. The first one is that, at a case of a failure, uh, operators will see all events. They will not miss an event. And this is usually called uh, at least once. Uh, and the basic mechanism to do that is stream replay. So replaying the stream uh, from a past uh, uh, point, checkpoint, say, if you're using Kafka uh, from, a last, from a past Kafka offset. The second thing that people uh, want uh, to guarantee is that operators do not perform duplicates update, duplicate updates on their state. So if you have a counter and the counter should be two, after a failure, it should not be three. It should again be two, right? Uh, and this is usually called exactly once. And there are several solutions uh, for this. Um, one solution is uh, the discretized streams uh, paper. Uh, and uh, a variant of that is implemented in Spark Streaming. So uh, essentially what this does is, is treats streaming as a series of small, atomic, immutable batch computations. And if there's a failure, the only thing you need to do is basically replay the last uh, computation. So that will guarantee to you that both the state and the result um, are consistent. Uh, this gives you basically a very fast track, so a very easy way to implement uh, fault tolerance for a streaming system. Uh, but has some limitations. Uh, in particular, it does not uh, separate cleanly the business logic that you write uh, from the logic that the, recover, that, that the system uses for recovery. So uh, changing a config parameter uh, might even change uh, the results of your job. Um, a second uh, extremely interesting uh, approach is uh, Millwheel, uh, as implemented in uh, Google Cloud Dataflow. So they're essentially uh, the way to guarantee exactly once is to take every event that comes, take the update to the state that this event produces and the results of this, ev the result of this event, and commit them atomically to a high-throughput, transactional, fully ACID-compliant store. Yeah? So this is actually great, but it assumes that you have access to a very high-throughput uh, transactional store, which Google does. But, but a lot of other uh, people don't. So uh, the way we went about it with Flink um, is to uh, essentially uh, implement a variant of the Sandy Lamport uh, algorithm for distributed snapshots. Um, I will tell you basically how this works. Um, so uh, think about it as follows. Uh, so instead of, uh, as in uh, the discretized streams approach, using the execution in order to draw checkpoints, you superimpose uh, the, uh, the mechanism for these checkpoints on top of the execution. So you can get the same result uh, as in discretized streams, but without ever stopping the stream, with always keeping the data flowing. So the way it works is the following. Uh, so this is an example. We have a bunch of sources. These are the yellow uh, logs sort of things. Uh, and then we have operators, uh, parallel instances of operators uh, that are green. Uh, they're interconnected in several ways. They're shuffling, they're pushing data to each other. Uh, and basically, at some point, the job manager, which is the master of Flink, says, hey, I'm starting now a checkpoint. Uh, and then it goes to all the sources and says, OK, tell me which is the event that you're reading right now. Uh, and we're calling this a barrier. Uh, and then the sources send this uh, sort of event 
uh, this barrier uh, on, uh, that you can think of as a logical time as well uh, to the master. At the case of a failure, the replay will start exactly uh, from that barrier. Now, you can think of these barriers as flowing through the topology and sort of pushing their prior events uh, to the operators. Yeah? And when an operator will actually see this barrier, uh, it will start checkpointing its state. So at any given time, an operator is either starting a checkpoint, doing a checkpoint, or having finished a checkpoint. What a checkpoint actually means is that once this data that is being pushed by the barrier updates the state, uh, then the operator will take the state and write it to a durable uh, and reliable storage. Uh, for Flink, uh, this is a pluggable mechanism. So currently, uh, you can use Flink's own job manager for small states, say you have an int counter, or you can use a file system through a file system interface, be that HDFS or like an in-memory file system uh, like Tachyon. Um, one complication is that operators need to wait uh, for all the barriers to come in. So uh, tasks that have multiple inputs need to wait until the barriers have pushed all the events and they have updated the state. Uh, but in the end, uh, when these barriers have actually uh, arrived to the sinks and all the operators said, hey, I've checkpointed my state, then this checkpoint um, has been finished. Now, at the time of the failure, restarting the sources from exactly that barrier and restarting the operators from the checkpointed state uh, guarantees you these, exactly these, exactly once uh, guarantees uh, that people want. And the cool thing about that uh, is that first, you never block data processing. So this mechanism of drawing checkpoints um, happens concurrently with data processing. Data always keeps flowing. It never stops, so it's true uh, streaming. You can checkpoint the data at any interval you would like. There can be multiple checkpoints running at the same time. So it is a mechanism to sort of um, separate uh, the recovery uh, from the data processing, if you wish. So you can balance, uh, you know, if you would like, uh, if you're okay with less overhead and more recovery time, uh, you can balance these two parameters. The second thing, uh, and very, very important, is that it separates uh, business logic from recovery. So this checkpointing interval is just a config parameter. Okay? You can change that, and the results of your streaming jobs uh, will be exactly the same. Uh, that, in contrast uh, to using the execution, as in mini batches, for checkpointing, where uh, the, the interval you, you choose for checkpointing is also the interval you use to window your data. Yeah? Uh, the third benefit is that this can support uh, richer windows, uh, so you don't have to restrict to things like time windows, but you, you, can, of course, you can also support event time, uh, session windows, uh, where you can, you can create windows of a specific session and so on. So in the end, it basically gives you the best of, of all three worlds. So you get true streaming latency, yeah? you never stop the stream, uh, you get exactly one semantics, and you get high throughput because your recovery overhead is very, very low. So we're pr very proud about that. Now, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, stream processor, a uh, few things, right? Pipelining, operator state, how to back up and restore that state to guarantee uh, exactly one semantics. The next thing that is equally important uh, is, okay, what tools are we giving to the user, right? So. Uh, in our experience, so yeah, in all of our experience, if, if a system does not give you an API that, that you would like to use, then not many people are going to use that. So what we're trying to do with Flink uh, is provide a data stream API that is very familiar for people that have been writing uh, functional batch programs. So if you look at this slide, we have uh, a basic word count implemented in the batch API of, Slim, of stream, uh, Flink, sorry, uh, data set and the streaming a API of uh, Flink uh, data stream. And basically, the only difference is that uh, you are declaring something uh, as a data stream uh, rather than a data set saying that, OK, this is unbounded. Here, we're reading. We're not, you're not reading from a file. You could read from a file, uh, but you're reading from a socket stream. Uh, and because you are grouping, uh, so there is this closer group by word, uh, an unbounded stream, you somehow need to impose a window on this stream. So here you're imposing a window of five seconds that triggers 
uh, the grouping uh, and the summing every one second. Yeah? So if you're coming from a batch background, there are a few new concepts for you to learn, so an unbounded stream and a window, uh, but it feels very natural. All right, uh, so as I said, uh, a lot of this uh, is work in progress. Uh, so the data stream API, of course, is out there. Everything, all the stack that I showed in the beginning uh, is out there. Our current focus right now is, so we're, we're still labeling uh, the data stream API as beta. Uh, our current focus is to, as soon as possible, uh, freeze and uh, make this uh, data stream API available, so graduated uh, from beta. Uh, provide a fully managed window and user-defined state uh, with an interface uh, to the user and the backend that you can control. So you would be able to sort of uh, uh, dump your state in a, in a file system or in, uh, say, Cassandra or in me memory grid and so on. So we would like this mechanism to be pluggable because this state you would actually want to use it um, for upstream services. Uh, and finally, we're working uh, short term uh, on providing uh, fully the table API for streams. And as I said, this is the path of the Flink project towards SQL on Flink, uh, and this way, hopefully, we get uh, two birds with one stone, that being SQL and Stream SQL, uh, or something like Stream SQL. Uh, and the longer term, as I said, I did not talk about uh, high, high availability in the master. That's, why, that's because we don't have this yet, but this is uh, also a major focus, dynamic scaling in and out of jobs. Um, one focus of the Flink project uh, is to provide not only the basic engine functionality, but also all the tools and APIs on top of that for streams. Uh, so another major goal is to provide the machine learning library and uh, the graph library, so Flink ML and Jelly, on top of streams. Uh, and the general vision, so what, what we are working uh, towards, is essentially bad stream unification. Bad stream unification means that you could write a program and you don't even know if your data sources are streaming on bots. You just try the program. And then the system will figure out uh, if, if all your data sources are just files, then it will follow a different path and execute it as a, bots, as a pure bots program. Uh, if you have a mixer, then it will execute it um, as a stream. All right, so I'm gonna be very early, which is good for everyone. You can enjoy your afternoon. Uh, just to close, so if you, uh, if you zoned out uh, during the talk, uh, <laughs> don't blame you. <laughs> um, what did I talk about? Yeah. Uh, so the first point um, I was trying to make is that streaming is not like, hey, uh, that's what we're, what, exactly what we're doing now, just a little bit faster. It's not uh, like, uh, you know, a super cool feature that few people uh, have access to, like, uh, you know, Wall Street and so on, but it's actually the next logical step in the data infrastructure. So it just simplifies things a lot. Uh, many people are building uh, so-called fast data um, platforms, uh, either inside or outside Hadoop, typically starting by putting Kafka and serving event streams to Kafka. All of these people, uh, the next thing they're going to look for uh, is uh, a good stream processor. Uh, and I tried to make the case for Flink as a good uh, stream processor uh, for a combination of four reasons. Uh, first, uh, the system has a proper foundation in the engine uh, to actually execute uh, these, these streaming programs with the pipelining and with the checkpointing mechanism that never sto stops the data from flowing. Um, second, uh, APIs uh, that are close to what people are used to uh, and uh, libraries that uh, will be all supported on top of the data stream API uh, integration with BATS, so the system uh, is, can do, also do BATS processing, yeah? and it does on top of the same runtime. Uh, and third, and fourth, um, uh, a very large and uh, still uh, very fast uh, growing community. Um, talking about community, uh, just I would like to share you uh, one last data point. Uh, so here, uh, I took the, the Git log of Flink, and we found like the unique uh, Git commits. Uh, so this shows sort of the growth uh, of the community. The, 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 the project has by now more than 100 uh, contributors, which makes me very, very happy because for me, Flink is not only a software system, it's also a community of people. Uh, and that places it, uh, yeah, at, at, as one of uh, the most active big data projects of the Apache Software Foundation uh, after just one year uh, from entering the Apache Incubator. Uh, 
And that's it. So if you find this exciting, uh, there are a few things you can do. So as every Apache project, we have our dev and user list. If you find that uh, too much to handle because the traffic is too high, there is a news at fling.apache.org uh, mailing list that will give you an email per month or so, or two emails per month. So you can subscribe to that one. You can follow the Fling blog at fling.apache.org slash blog. And of course, uh, follow Fling on Twitter. If you are in town next week, uh, there are two more presentations on Flink. Uh, the first one is in June 16 in uh, San Francisco at the Spark and Friends Meetup. And actually on June 17, uh, in Redwood City, there is uh, the first installment of the Bay Area uh, Apache Flink Meetup. Uh, and finally, um, the, the community is organizing a conference in Berlin, uh, Germany. It is called uh, Flink Forward, which is funny because Fling is fast in German, so it's like fast forward. Uh, so it's uh, October 12 and 13 uh, in Berlin. So if you're doing something with the system, if you want to share your experiences, please do submit a talk there. Uh, if you want to learn more about the system, there will be uh, trainings uh, included uh, in, the, in the ticket price. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you. And there, there are some mics. If you want to ask a question. Yeah, excellent talk. And I just wonder whether you could summarize the comparison between Flint and Spark, because the architecture is, it looks really similar. C could you repeat the question? Uh, can you compare Flink with, with Spark? Uh, because the architecture is, it looks very similar yeah. And both of them seem to be do the both the streaming batch, yeah. you know, machine learning, all those things, yeah. and yeah. and and also it would be lovely to see how you compare the community support in both the side. Yeah. So the question is, can you compare uh, Fling and Spark uh, because they look very similar, and how is uh, in, in terms of a stack, and how you compare the community uh, su support? Or? <laughs> yes. So let me do that. Uh, so, first of all, um, if you look at the dataset API, uh, indeed, you will find many similarities to the RDD API. Yeah. This is basically an artifact of programming against collections, yeah, which is also in scalding and so on. So, I actually find a, so this, this paradigm of having a parallel connection, a collection and doing functional transformations on top of this collection uh, is sort of becoming the standard. Uh, in this world, this is what people want to do. Um, the main difference between Fling and Spark is how they support, uh, how these things are executed uh, at the back end. Uh, so Fling uh, executes uh, both this data set and this data stream API on top of a streaming engine, whereas if you wish Spark executes uh, the RDD and the DStream API on top of an in-memory batch engine. So if you wish, Fling is bats and stream on top of streaming, whereas Spark is like bats and stream on top of bats, to some extent. Um, the community size, um, so, so Spark has a bigger community. Uh, yeah, much, I don't know how big uh, it is, but it's, it's, much, it's probably much, much bigger. The Fling community uh, is growing fast, so I'm, I'm optimistic. So the, the two communities are sort of uh, going on at the same time. So Fling entered the incubator. Uh, one year ago, and the community is still growing fast. Uh, I'm not sure what, what kind of comparison we can make there. Uh, do you have any like, performance comparison between the Flint and the Spark? Y yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm aware of, I, I don't have any uh, for you right now. Uh, you know, there, there are you, but, but you can you know, easily extrapolate a few things. So there are several use cases where pipelining uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, so it really depends on, on the workload. Uh, there, there are use cases where I assume Spark uh, can be faster. So what is, what is happening right now, I think, is that a few people are running these benchmarks. So at least one person has contacted the Fling mailing list and, is, and said they're doing a, a benchmark study between these two systems and they will report back soon. So I think we will, we will have results uh, soon about that. Uh, and you know, if, you know, if I had the results, I'm not a neutral observer anyway, so it's, it's much better if somebody else uh, gives it to us. 
Hi. Uh, uh, does it support uh, a form of a rule engine or a decisioning, a real-time decisioning uh, capability? Um, does does Flink support a real-time decisioning capability, like uh, being able to um, uh, specify or set a number of rules, and when those rules materialize, you can take certain decisions? Okay. Um, so. The question is whether there is real-time decision-making availability in terms of a rule engine. Um, so you can implement that as an application on top of Flink. Yeah, so you can, you can embed a rule engine inside the parallel operators, but it does not give that to you as, uh, let's say, a decision-making API. I have a more of a business question. Like, what's your commercial model? Do you support it? If you can tell it, or do you license it? How, how does this? How does that work? Yeah, I, I cannot tell you too much about it uh, yet. Uh, so what I can tell you is that we're we're developing it in open source. Okay. Uh, so it's free right, and right. open source, uh, and we are working together uh, with some uh, selected uh, users that are using it in large installations. Uh, and supporting those guys, uh, but but there's no but we don't have a, an open support program yet. Thank you. Right. So the question. Right, so the question is, in the intermediate steps of the topology where you're persisting the state for recovery, where uh, do you persist the state? This is a pluggable mechanism, yeah? So it is not, so, so it assumes a certain interface. Right now, uh, there, this is implemented for uh, any file system, uh, so something like HDFS or an in-memory file system, a Stachion, anything that, has, uh, that implements a file system interface. Uh, and uh, also the Flink's own job manager if you want to, s to store like small counters and so on. Um, as I said, we are working uh, on supporting alternative backends as well. Uh, so we, so th there are some people in the community that are looking at things like Apache Ignite, so in-memory grids, uh, to do that very efficiently. Mm -hmm. But here you stop queuing to uh, go back to an So, so in, in Fling, what happens when you are uh, when you have a failure and you're recomputing? Um, so, imagine that these checkpoints are drawn every so many seconds. Yeah, let's say every five seconds. At the time of a failure, you're gonna have to reprocess the last five seconds of data. Yes, yes. So it goes back. So uh, right now, the system does not keep upstream backups at the operators. It goes all the way back to Kafka. There's no reason why, why that is not possible. I'm not sure if I'm here. Let's, can we take that offline? Cool. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I think you briefly touched upon that during the presentation, but I'd like you to clarify when you have a, one of these tasks that has multiple input streams, um, can you repeat like how is the fault tolerance handled? And also, uh, is there any notion of deterministic replaying uh, or reprocessing, or is that like not, uh, not included? Okay, so for the first question, um, so if you have multiple inputs, you need to wait uh, for the barriers uh, of all the incoming channels to, to reach the operator. In this case, you do back pressure the stream, okay? So this is a case for back pressure. Uh, there is a way to solve that, which is to take, let's say, incremental checkpoints, but it's not, it's not in the system yet. Um, the second question is determinism. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how, um, how to answer that. So the, the exactly ones guarantees are there. 
Uh, ordering guarantees can be lost at shuffles, but are preserved at forward channels. Uh, but perhaps this, we should talk about this more in depth as well. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is the y-axis? All right, so the, the y-axis is time, but it is not a linear axis, because this, is, this computes a point for every commit. The, so the, the x-axis is time. The y-axis is people. Yeah, Co uh, contributors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Support for late arriving events, out of order events, right. Um, I don't want to say something with certainty. I, 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 know, I know that there is ongoing work on this um, using essentially the same mechanism as Millwheel, but I'm not completely sure what is the status of this, whether it is, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot.